So the first thing I'm going to start off with here is what, what we're, we're dubbing the heterogeneity problem. And this is undoubtedly a phenomenon that you guys have uh, recognized um, in visualizing kids in the classroom. Uh, and we're just now trying to quantify it and understand it much better so we can inform decisions about, about how to uh, treat kids with various types of disorders. Okay, so one goal when we examine various complex behaviors or brain physiology in children or early youth is determine if the information directly associates with developmental trajectories or, or mental health issues that, that are going on now or later in life. Can information from these types of tools, um, psychiatric, you know, psychiatric diagnosis, brain imaging, behavioral testing, at a given developmental state, a system predicting future outcomes, right? Can the information help us tailor <coughs> education or provide early interventions to improve yeah. health or other long-term outcomes of a given individual? That's one of the questions that lots of folks that are in my field are trying to work on right now. Now, typically, what we've done when we've started this up until you know recently, um, for some people is that we, we try to define, we try to define one group, my pointer here is not working, so I'll just correct it. We try to define one group based on some classification scheme, right? And this, most times in psychiatric diagnosis based on the, the DSM, some of you have heard of, compared to another group that's been defined in some other way. In my lab, I study autism, I study ADHD. All the examples I've been given today are about ADHD, but we're applying the same thing to autism. We take a group of kids that have been diagnosed as having ADHD and compare them to a group of controls to identify if they have atypical behavior or atypical brain physiology, atypical connectivity, um, like we just described earlier. But there are some problems with doing, doing the work this way. One is, is that the model that this relies on the assumption that our current diagnostic categories represent one homogeneous, etiologically homogeneous syndromes, group right? The other is that it also presumes that the typically developing kids are also just one big group, right? Even kids that don't have problems are quite different um, in scope. It might be in the case of ADHD that there are multiple mechanisms that are leading to the behavioral phenotype that may look the same in the classroom or in the clinic. And at the same time, there are different types of profiles in even typically developing kids that are, are that deems them likely not to be one big group, okay? So, now in the case of ADHD, there have been, for years, there have been people that are trying to, have been trying to describe that this, this, this phenomenon must be true. There must be multiple groups in the ADHD population related to, that, that are mechanistically different, or leading to the same phenotype, right? But while it's easy to propose conceptually that there must be these distinct subgroups within populations, or even typical populations, demonstrating that those subgroups exist is very difficult. And here's the reason why. Here's one of the reasons why. So if, you, if your classroom is just massive, let's say it's a group of three kids in your class, right? It's really easy. There's only three different ways that you can subdivide your classroom or two different ways actually, with three kids, right? But as soon as your, your classroom gets up to 10 kids, there's now 21,000 different ways that you can subdivide those, those 10 kids into different subgroups. By the time your class size gets up to 15, or over a, a, mil, a, a billion different ways, and over, over, over time you get 20 kids in your classroom, there's over a trillion different ways that you can subdivide that classroom into different Computationally, this is not an easy phenomenon to deal with. Now, what we've been doing, and what others have been have been starting to do, is use various types of mathematical disciplines to try to to inform potential subdivisions that in typically developing or kids that have men, uh, developing um, mental disorders. What we've been using is what's called graph theory. And I get to describe that to you guys right now. What is graph theory? Well, graph theory is all about the study of networks, where networks are just simply collections of nodes, so nodes can be anything from people to places to cities, right, that are linked by some line or edge. So that would be friends between people, 
roads between cities, or in the case of web pages, links between different, different web pages. Okay? Now, what we gradually have been used in lots of different, different fields of study, from trying to understand how networks on the internet work, to US commuting patterns, to things like how committees and subcommittees in Congress inter uh, talk to each other, well, <laughs> assuming that everything is working properly, of course, <laughs> to trying to understand how proteins act or proteins interact in one cell organisms like yeast. Okay? And what you can see from all these pictures, right, is that is that they're not regular, right? It's not simply person A connects to person B, or web page A connects to person <laughs> web page B, that connects to C, that connects to D, that connects back to A, right? And it's also not random. Right? There's clearly some types of structure in all these, all these different pictures. And so we try, what we try to do with graph theory is we say, well, how do we quantify the, the patterns that we're seeing in here? And well, what do they mean with regard, to, with regard to the nature of the system? So there are lots of different metrics that we use regarding network, network structure. There are simple things like degree. You have a kid in your classroom that has lot, lots, of, lots of friends. Then you have children like me when I was growing up who have very, very few and sitting in the corner by themselves, right? Very few connections. You have things like path length. So if I want to get information from this node here to this node here, I have to have, I have to, I have to jump three different connections, okay? Now the path length from, the path length from a given <coughs> node to all the other nodes, the, the average number of jumps for a person to get information to everybody else in the network is the average path length of a given node or a person. And there are things like clustering coefficients. So they ask, well, how tight are your clicks or groups, right? So this guy here has got three friends, one, two, three. How many, how many of my friends are also friends with each other? Okay, so this, in this example, we have um, we have three friends, there's two connections out of a total possible three, so it would be two divided by three. That would be the clustering coefficient for this particular individual. Okay? Now, probably the most widely recognized finding, right, with regard to the study of graph theory is the idea of a small world network. Right? It's the whole reason why our games like Six Degrees and Kevin Bacon or Six Degrees and Separation, why they actually work, right? The idea that any two people, no matter how distant, uh, no matter how distant they may be, can be linked by at least one, but probably several very short paths. And when I, um, when I, and the reason why this works is because there's high clustering in some groups, and there's specific hubs or nodes um, that help link different folks. Now, when I gave this talk to the, the to the neuroscience caucus in, in Congress, I, and this is one of the funny examples I gave is how you can get from Tom Cruise to Teddy Roosevelt in just one, two, three, four steps. Tom Cruise was in A Few Good Men with Kevin Bacon, who was in Murder of the First with Wally Rose, who was in Dick Tracy versus Crime Inc. with Walter McGrail, who was in Womanhood, The Glory of the Nation with Teddy himself. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is a different measurement than the small world measurement. That's the idea of modules that there are clusters of nodes that are densely connected relative to other clusters of nodes in a system. We call this modularity or community detection, and we have algorithms that we can use to identify whether these types of clusters actually exist and then how important they are with regard to the system. Now, I'm a, I'm a brain imager, I'm a neuroscientist. A lot of my work in the past has used nodes being our brain regions and the links between those nodes being this functional connectivity, this intrinsic brain activity stuff, right? And what that has led to is lots of different work that has identified how the brain is intrinsically organized into these very specific systems. So things like very specific types of networks that you can see distributed across, across the whole brain. Some of these networks are really important for attending. Some of these networks are really important for visual processing. Some of them are important for memory. All different types of, all different types of brain functions. But today, what I'm going to do is instead of our nodes being brain regions and our connections being this functional connectivity stuff, today our, our nodes are people, children, 
And the connections between them is how they perform on different types of tasks. Okay? So things like working memory, the ability to maintain in a, in a short period of time um, a few items, uh, keep it held in mind. Things like inhibition, being able to inhibit pre-potent pre responses. I was thinking of an example last night, I was going to say, like passing a note uh, in class, but that's probably not a very good example. It's probably more like giving, you know, writing a text while you're sitting in class or something. These days. Things like arousal or activation or, or kind of being awake. Uh, how, how many things can you hold in mind? How fast can you process information? All these different, we have lots of different tasks that can measure these types of things. And the whole idea is, <coughs> can we find individuals that cluster together how they perform on, on, on tasks versus not? And then does, is, that, is that informative? All right, so how would we use this stuff to inform heterogeneity and samples we reacted? Okay, so this is just an experiment that was done with almost 500 kids um, between the ages of seven and 12. Where we got all these different types, we had a lot of different tasks that measured all these different types of, of, uh, of cognitive functions that are important for normal brain function. We correlated all these different guys, every different subject, and we saw that some kids were performing very similarly across all the different types of functions, while some other kids performed very dissimilarly. They weren't similar at all. So the kids that performed very similar were connected, and the kids that were not very similar across all these tasks were not connected. And then we can run our modularity assignments to see if we can find these, these hidden subgroups in the population. Now we first ran this on our ADHD kids, the kids that have ADHD, and we were very excited because we found these very unique subpopulations. Up in this graph means poor performance. So we found some kids that were atypical in things like they had just their responses on, on some tasks were just all over the place. They were very variable. This is a hallmark, one of the hallmarks of ADHD. Some kids were very poor in things like executive functions, like being able to work in memory, like I described earlier. Some kids were worse than, worse than and other things. But the point here is that they may have been atypical in this particular thing, but they were otherwise normal in everything else. So all the kids, even though they all had the diagnosis of ADHD, they all look the same, they all look exactly the same in the clinic. If you dig down the details, we, that they were very, very different in many ways, okay? But then we made the mistake of actually looking at the kids who developed typically normal. And what we found was they have almost the exact same patterns as we saw in the kids that have ADHD, right? We saw kids that were more atypical in, in, in this measure versus, uh, um, versus the others. The executive function, the pattern was nearly identical. It was disappointing at first. We thought we must have done something wrong until the light bulb went on and said, aha, maybe the typically developing control kids aren't all of them in one big homogeneous group either. Maybe there is, maybe there's some heterogeneity even in kids who don't have, who don't have a developmental psychiatric disorder like ADHD. And so we reasoned, well, you know, if you, if you look and you compare all the kids with ADHD against all the, all the control positive kids, we saw across all these, this has been shown many times, that all the different domains of cognitive functions, the kids with ADHD are poorer than the, than the control kids. This has been shown many times over. Okay? Then we said, well, what, what, but wait, what if, we, what if we compare the kids with ADHD within their own profile, the cognitive profile, the style, how they approach these different tasks? What do the, the ADHD kids look like then? And what we found, and I'm just going to make a long story short here, is that, that they were, it was very different than what would happen if you just compared everybody to everybody else. Some kids, indeed, were poor in all the different tasks, right? But some kids were almost, they, had, they were almost identical to the control population across all the different, all the different domains, except for maybe one. So what it told us is that, is that understanding how, understanding, well, here, that what this told us is that some of the variability you see in how kids perform in, in, on all these different types of cognitive tasks is not just simply, the variance isn't simply just one big unimodal distribution, but rather there are likely these different sub-pockets of kids who perform in different ways. And that understanding that this variation just in the normal population 
that, that you can see in typically developing children may help us understand more definitively the needs of a given child that may present with a disorder like, like ADHD. And I'll get more, I'll add more of that in just a second. Now, can similar phenomena be demonstrated with the brain imaging, with the stuff that we, we talked about, this intrinsic brain activity that we talked about in the beginning? So now, instead of looking at how, how similar kids are across all these different types of tasks, now we look at now we look at how similar are their brains as far as this functional intrinsic connectivity stuff looks. And we again we do the exact same thing where we try to see if we can identify potential subgroups in the population. Now we used to for this we looked at the we looked at the um, what we do is we look at this brain region called the nucleus accumbens, really important for reward processing or impulsive impulse control. Okay? And we look to see how that the connectivity with that brain region is different across all the Again, to make a long story uh, short, um, what, we had, what we were able to show is that the, um, that the typically we, often, we, we saw these three groups, they could all group into, um, they all had some proportion of kids with ADHD and some kids that were typically that without a diagnosis. We saw that the patterns of brain activity were quite different across all, all, these, all these different groups. We see this control population where you see this is, a, this is a picture of, the, of how these signals are correlating with each other. The bright means is tightly, tightly correlated with this, this brain region that's really important for impulse control. The blue parts mean they're negatively, mean they're, when one's going up, the other one's going down, mean they're negatively correlated. This is what the, the brain of the control population look like, the kid with ADHD, and this is where the difference is lie. Okay? This is in the first group that we identified. Second group looks like this. And now, in this case, the brain patterns are quite different from before. I'm just going to flip back that we saw from before to here. Overall, and where the difference is lie in the NHD group is quite different than what we saw before, too. And this is just another, one more example where, again, the patterns across everybody are quite different. And again, the patterns is where it lies in the kids with ADHD is different yet again. Okay? So overall, what this is telling us is that, is that a portion of what we're seeing in, the, in typically developing populations is, uh, is embedded in the, these discrete communities, right? So we have these different, even in kids who are developing normally, that they're not just one big group, but they all have these different profiles of how they approach the problems that you can identify with behavior and in the brain. But it also suggests that, that kids with ADHD, that, that they're, that, their brains and their behavior is nested in kind of what's, what's the global variation. Okay, so what the, these global subgroups, that they're kind of nested in that. And that maybe that, may that identifying kind of the mechanisms associated with mental disorders, like ADHD, re requires comparing or examining them within the cognitive style of profile. Now, but I'm just gonna bring us back to the original question, which was, can information from this, these tools at a given developmental stage, the system predicting what's going to happen in the future, right? Will they learn this lesson I'm giving them today? Will they have a new uh, problem with regard to their disorder later on, a year from now? So we've been able to apply this stuff, you know, now the thing is, is that in the classroom or even in the clinic, we're not going to be able to give kids MRIs, right? If we're trying to, if we're trying to identify their best learning style or their, what's going to happen in the future. And so, one of the postdocs in the lab has been, is, is what, what she's been doing is taking some kind of simple measurements on temperament um, that she can it, it apply the same types of principles. Now, I'm gonna, in, in this case, you can measure all different types of behavioral principles, things like, um, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit, but these first things are things like attention again, but then there's other things like high fear, high intensity for pleasure, impulsivity, inhibitory control, a lot of uh, behaviors that are, you see in, in kids. And what she did was she applied the community detection to the same type of thing, but used this very simple measure that takes only you know, 25 minutes or so. Very simple measure. measure. And what she found is these three different, three different types of groups. The one she called an uncomplicated, the one she called a surgeon group, and the one she called a negative emotion group. And I'll explain why she called it that in just one second. So the uncomplicated group here, what, they, what she saw was that 
on all these attention measures, you can easily expect they have ADHD. What she found was that that they all uh, that they all all the groups had atypical measures, but the kids that were uncomplicated had nothing no before typical than other measures. The other two groups were quite different, though. One group, what she called the negative emotion group, was mostly atypical, like anger, discomfort, fear, very high sadness, sadness couldn't be soothed. The other was very excited. These are the kids who are like really go-getters. They're just like, I gotta do something now. I gotta do it. You come to the clinic and they're, they're, they just can't wait to start getting on the computer to do the task, right? These kids, on the other hand, they get very upset. They get very upset when they're doing when they're, when they when they're asked to do something different than what they're expecting. Them to do. Now, the brain connectivity across all these groups is quite different. I'm not going to go over that because I want to have any time for questions. But what really was the most important about this is that at, even, even though we got these, we saw these kids at age nine, even just a year later, identifying these different subgroups, we were able to predict and then that, that group that was very, gets very upset when they're doing this, these types of things. Almost half of them in just one year went on to have a new onset type disorder, things like, um, things like depression. High anxiety, um, um, uh, uh, compulsive disorders, um, ADD. All of these kids, these specific subgroups of ADD that you can identify here that you otherwise can't tell the difference with on the, on the clinical, you can predict in one year that they're going to half of them are going to go on to have these additional problems, which, de which describes how important it is to understand these heterogeneity in these different populations. So, and I have, I did, I have a time So, the, the question is, can information from these non-invasive tools, these new technologies that we're using, and products such as brain imaging, at a given development of stage, assist in predicting future outcomes? Can this information help us tailor education or pro provide early interventions to improve health or other long-term outcomes? Well, all this stuff's still very, still very much a work in progress, but it's clear that characterizing the heterogeneity a, ph a phenomenon explained in part by these, by these brain measurements that I, I talked about earlier. A typical and atypical population is likely going to be a major component that will have to be improved if we are able to you know, reveal our full potential in this regard.